Thank you so much, Baba Jeff. Yes. Asante Sana, that was beautiful. Thank you, Stones of Fire. Thank you to everyone. Greetings to everyone. Um, on this soulful Sunday, greetings to everyone under the sound of my voice on this soulful Sunday, this spiritual Sunday. We want to welcome you here to Wose Community Church. And um, first and foremost, I want to get out um, the housekeeping, um, get that out the way. So when you are logging on at the bottom of your screen and your um, with your picture, hopefully you have your name. If you do not have your name, hopefully you have your video camera on so we can know who you are. Um, security issues plus, you know, family issues. You know, we want to be able to see you your smiling face, your beautiful spirit. And so please uh, make sure your name is at the bottom or your, um, or your video is on. If neither one of those things are happening, somebody will get in contact with you and um, help you to get those things going. All right, so um, yes, I said, welcome to Will Say Community Church. And Will Say Community Church is the community of the way. The way is ma'at truth, justice, and righteousness. We believe in the teachings of our ancestors and, and our elders that the creator God created the universe in all life and has placed in each of us a part of the divine spirit. God living in us and through us has given us the right and the power to establish peace and justice in all human life and true harmony with all of creation. We believe in the living faith of our ancestors. Ashe. 
Next is our affirmation. And our affirmation is going to be given to us by Mama Fania and Sister Jalia. And then right after that, we are going to have a song from Sister I mean, from To Be New Cultural Gatherers. So right now, Mama Fania and Sister Jalia. Good morning. Haban Rahotep will say. Will say's community affirmation. We will know God's truth to be free and self-determined. Creator, help us to remember the humanity, glory, and suffering of our ancestors and to honor the struggles of our elders. Let us strive to bring new vision and life to our people. Let there be peace and harmony among us. Let us be loving, sharing, and creative. Let us work, study, and listen so we may learn, teach, and cultivate self-reliance. Grant us power, O Holy One, as we struggle to resurrect our hearts and our homeland. We will raise our children according to the needs of our nation with discipline, patience, devotion, and courage. We will strive to bring the new, to be the living models of the new direction of our people. We are an African people. We are children of God. Ashe. I say, I say, I say. To be new, cultural gatherers, for a song. Greetings. Greetings, everyone. This is Brian B. Bowling. Yes, good morning, Rose. So good to be here this morning. I am Zakia, G-E-K part bowling. And, and we, we are, are the, the To Be New, New Cultural gatherers. gatherers. We would like to give a tribute this afternoon for the great late musician that recently passed last week. If you haven't heard, Farrell Sanders made his transition last week. He was um, 81 years old. His birthday was coming up on the 13th of October. He would have been 30. 82, pardon me. And um, he was influenced by many musicians, particularly John Coltrane was one of his influencers. He said he's from, was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, and came to New York in the early 60s. And when he arrived in New York, he joined up with the famous musician Sun Ra. And Sun Ra actually gave him the name Pharaoh. His birth name was Pharrell, Pharrell Sanders. But uh, Sun Ra changed his name to Pharaoh Saunders. And he also had a, a great collaboration with the great vocalist, Leon Thomas. Today, we would like to do a composition by Pharaoh Saunders. And the name of the composition is, got, you got to think about the one who made us all. My poem is entitled, Music Flowed from Pharaoh's Soul. about the one who made us all. Think about the one who made us all. Think about the one who made us all. A new dream. Dream. A new scene. Sing. Think about the one who made us all. Think about the one who made us all. Think about the one who made us all. A new day. A new way. way. Think about the one who made us all. Think about the one who made us all. Think about the one who made us all. I love you. You. You 
of me. Me? Think about the one who made us all. Think about the one. strength on this new day he brings us faith and love think about the one and love think about the one thank you lord think about the one thank you lord Thank 
you love. Think about the one for your love. Think about the one. Thank you, Lord. Think about the one for your love. Think about the one. I won't forget you, Lord. Think about the one. Won't forget you, Lord. Think about the one. No, no, won't forget you, Lord. I love all of the music, okay? All of the TV New Cultural Gatherers songs, just awesome. So um, again, thank you so much for Mama Fania and Sister Jalia, who gave us the affirmation for TV New Cultural Gatherers for that song. Um, next, we're going to have historical tribute by Brother Desmond. And then right after the historical tribute, we're going to come right back to TV New Cultural Gatherers for another song. I am so excited about this. Brother Desmond, please unmute yourself. There we go. Grand Rising, Wilson we'll family. I hope everyone's doing well. Great song. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, my historical tribute. will be on the inventor, Garrett Morgan. Hopefully some of you guys heard of him before. If you haven't, I'm just going to give a brief overview. There's so much to say on this brother. Um, uh, a great inventor. And so I chose to actually uh, do, do a historical tribute on him. Uh, let me go ahead and expand my screen. Let's... Okay, <clears throat> Garrett Morgan. He was born in Paris, Kentucky on March 4th, 1877 in Claysville, Kentucky in a small town just north of Lexington in the state capital. His mother, uh, her name was Elizabeth Reed Morgan. She was born enslaved and, in, in, and was of Indian and African descent and a daughter of a Baptist minister. His father, Sidney, was formerly enslaved, but freed uh, in 1863, was the son of John Hunt Morgan, a, who was a Confederate colonel. Uh, Morgan's mixed race heritage would play a part in his business dealings as an adult. Uh, during the time, they struggled to support their large family on earnings from their small farm. Garrett Morgan was the seventh of 11 children. Moving on. Garrett attended a school only through grade five and then sought to work. Due to little work around Claysville, he left home at the age of 14. He headed north for the nearest large city in Cincinnati, Ohio, where employment was plentiful. In 1894, Morgan moved to Cleveland with barely a cent to his name, looking for work uh, with machinery. Uh, during that time, he slept in boxcars while he tried to scrape together some money uh, sweeping floors in a factory, in factories in his local neighborhood. Uh, later, Garrett found many people willing to hire um, a Black laborer. He had talent for fixing broken idols, items, and so he worked four years as a handyman doing odd jobs and repairs for wealthy white people. Moving on. Morgan found uh, a few jobs and found jobs as a sewing machine adjuster 
uh, with one of the companies named for Roots and McBride, the manufacturer. He enjoyed the challenge of fixing broken machines and fine tu and fine tuning them. Over the next decade, he found steady work fixing and adjusting sewing machines for several companies. Knowing his skills in high demand, Morgan began, sorry, Morgan went into business for himself in 1907. He began repairing cells, um, selling uh, and sewing machines from his own shop. In 1908, he married and he became good at this. And so after he started his own shop in 1907, the next year in 1908, he married a Bavarian woman. Uh, her name was Mary Ann Hasek and they had three sons. He expanded his business into a tailoring shop that produced coats, suits, um, and dresses, uh, later hiring 32 workers. He patented his first invention, invention uh, sewing machine improvement, and sold it for only $50. Uh, during this time, uh, Gary Morgan began a hair refinery company, eventually, Using uh, oh, that's the part. So during this time, when he was uh, when he was working with sewing machines, he was working on a special lubricant for the sewing machine needles. So the needles were moving so fast with the sewing machine, sometimes they will just burn through the clothes. So trying to create this lubricant for the needle, um, he actually got his hands all sticky and oily. He grabbed a special type of fur cloth. Later on, to wipe his hands, later on, he saw that cloth, uh, the, and the cloth actually um, straightened. So this led him into his next invention. Um, so he went and took, when he saw this, uh, the, when he saw the oil on the cloth of the hair straightened, he took that same on uh, the same uh, formula and applied it to one of his neighbor's co-workers dogs, Airedale estate. And the Airedale's hair stood up straight. And then later on, he started, he, uh, he saw, hey, this worked on the dog. Let me try it on myself. And so he used that solution on his hair and created a uh, uh, hair straightening cream. And as you can see, there's a picture of him right here with his hair kind of straightened. <laughs> so moving on, uh, Jay Morgan uh, started uh, his hair refinery company uh, eventually. That, and then he also eventually de developed a hair dye and a curved tooth iron comb. Morgan brought Morgan bought his own house and sent, and sent, um, sent for his mother to come live with him. Uh, moving on, Morgan was one of the... Yeah, sorry, I'm going to skip this part. Morgan bought his own house and sent for his mother to come live with him. Uh, moving on, leading us into his next invention, um, Morgan had a big company, now a good-sized company, and he was concerned about safety, fire safety. And he noticed that in 1911, there was a triangle shirtwaist company fire in New York that killed 146 trap workers. Um, this led and motivated Morgan to design a helmet to help firefighters survive smoke and deadly fumes. His gas inhalator consisted of a durable hood that fit over the head with two long tubes that ran from the head to the floor. One tube took in air at the floor below the smoke with an absorbent material, one moistened cooled in, cooled in incoming air and prevented smoke and dust particles from being pulled in there and up the tube. The second tube was for exhaling. Uh, you can see the picture of the diagram to the right on your screen. Morgan later improved the helmet, so it used a bag of compressed air, which prevented possible air supply contamination to last about 20 minutes. He designed the helmet to, put, to be also to be put on quickly within seven seconds and pulled off in three seconds for firefighters in case of this, cases of emergency. Uh, he called this the breathing device. He set up another company to brand it and called it the Morgan Helmet. It passed every test that the firefighters created for it, and eventually he won the first grand prize at an international sanitation exposition in New York. On October 14th, he obtained his patent for this helmet. Morgan hired, and during this time, 
even go through several tests with different companies um, that uh, had created a gas mask. And one company, gas mask, I believe they last lasted, uh, they went into a, a building with smoke and other companies gas mask uh, allowed them only like 11 to 17 minutes where Morgan's gas mask uh, allowed people to breathe longer than 20 minutes to 25 minutes. Um, moving on, he became very popular. Um, he started trying to begin to sell his gas mask, but unfortunately later on that wasn't successful because they found out the inventor of this gas mask was black. Uh, so Morgan hired a white front man uh, while he posed as a Canadian Indian assistant. Uh, moving on during World War I, the gas mask also helped American soldiers and used an improved and used an improved version of the Morgan mask to fight deadly clouds of pouring gas dislodged to them in entrenchments by the enemy. Um, another uh, one of the things I wanted to also state was on July 24th, 1916, there was a catastrophic fire in Cleveland, um, in the Cleveland, by the Cleveland Waterworks uh, Division uh, in Lake Erie. Several members, about 246 people were, uh, sorry, let me go back. About 282 feet below the surface, uh, a lot of people, I'll say about maybe 50 to 100, were trapped in the explosion. And during the explosion, these people were trapped. They sent in different rescue crews, and no one was able to uh, save them with their current equipment. And then with this gas mask by Morgan, he was the third um, crew that went in. He was able to rescue the people that passed out from the toxic from the toxic fumes and pull out individuals and uh, was able to save a lot of lives. And he, this, and he became more popular after this. Um, moving on, this was not, the gas mask was not his only invention. He also created the traffic light. Uh, he was the first black man in Cleveland. Um, and this was brought on when he got his first car. He was the first black man in Cleveland to own a car. Um, and he also worked on mechanical skills and developed um, a friction clutch, a drive clutch on the car. Uh, during the 1920s with this car, he witnessed a lot of accidents uh, driving his vehicle in Cleveland uh, at intersections. Only way he believed to um, direct traffic then was to station officers, police officers, or uh, traffic uh, control officers at each intersection. And this was not practical. Uh, Morgan developed a signpost with a rotating traffic signal. The word stop was printed in large letters on two opposite sides of a rectangle. And the word go was printed on the end of the rectangle, which the face, uh, which faced the traffic, uh, which faced the traffic to proceed. Uh, Morgan uh, proposed having the signs electrically, sorry, electrically lit so they would be visible at night as well as during the day. In 1923, he created a new kind of traffic signal, one with a warning light to alert drivers that they would need to stop after witnessing a carriage at a particular problematic intersection. Morgan quickly acquired patents for this signal. Uh, moving on, he later sold his invention to General Electric for $40,000. And there is a picture of the traffic light right there on your screen that he just uh, designed. There's another picture uh, of the track light he designed, as you can see, had the word stop on it. I believe on the side, it had the word go. And not sure how this rotated, but it worked. Um, moving on. Outside, uh, Morgan was an activist in the community. Outside of his uh, inventing career, Morgan dil diligently supported the African-American community through his lifetime. He was a member of the newly formed National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, he was active in the Cleveland Association of Colored Men and donated to Negro colleges and opened 
an all-Black country club. Additionally, in the 1920s, he launched the African-American newspaper, The Cleveland Call, later named The Call in the Post. Uh, outside of his... Um, uh, Later on, Morgan began developing glaucoma in 1943 and lost most of his sight as a result. The accomplished inventor died in Oakland, Ohio on July 27, 1963, shortly before the huge celebration in Chicago honoring the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation of Pro uh, Proclamation Centennial, an event he had been waiting uh, to attend and he died one more one month short. This was one of the few goals he ever failed. Uh, just before his death, Morgan was honored by the U.S. government for his traffic signal invention, and he was eventually restored uh, to his place in history as a hero of the Lake Erie uh, rescue. Uh, moving on and concluding. Morgan improved and saved countless lives worldwide, including those of firefighters, soldiers, and vehicle operators. With his profound inventions, his work provided the blueprint for many important advances that came later on and continues to inspire and serve as the basis for research conducted by modern day inventors and engineers. And so today I give honor and homage to Garrett Morgan, one of our prominent inventors in history. Amen and not shame. Not shame. Not shame. To be new, <clears throat> excuse me, to be new cultural gatherers. Yes, well, greetings, Jose. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, our second se selection for this service will be a composition. Uh, written by uh, Duke Ellington, Edward Kennedy Ellington. And Duke Ellington wrote this composition back in 1943. And he debuted it with his orchestra at Carnegie Hall in New York City. And the extended work he did was called Black, Beige, and Brown. Today we will do a segment of that extended work, which is entitled Come Sunday. My poem is entitled our creator, our Lord. touched 
by love that magnifies, connecting our hands, connecting our hearts through our hands. Watching over the flock, making sure our wandering brings us together. Oneness of spirit is here, there, everywhere, always at the perfect moment. Silence echoes the loudest, like a quiet storm, towering mighty. Our ancestors are here in spirit. How perfect is this moment? Yes, we have been touched by love that magnifies, connecting our hearts through our hands, connecting our hearts through our hands, connecting our hearts through our hands. cultural gatherers and thank you uh, so much Asante Sana to Brother Desmond for that awesome historical tribute. I'm sure we all learned a little bit more about Garrett Morgan. Um, so <laughs> next uh, we're going to have our litany of sacrifice and prayer by um, Mama Michelle and Baba Damani and then after that the next voice you will hear will be um, Minister Imhotep um, and he will be introducing our our uh, speaker for today. So we are at Mama Michelle and Baba Dimani. Uh, greetings, everyone. Aunt Johnson, peace, prosperity, and health. Nice to see uh, the Wolze family together. Okay, on the, uh, it's time for our litany of sacrifice. Um, pay our bills and make sure our um, respective uh, churches uh, remain uh, financial sovereign. I like to call this uh, section of our service uh, Yajima, we get to practice collective work and responsibility to make sure our um, institution stays sovereign. Anyway, litany of sacrifice. Um, save us, O Holy One, by your name. Vindicate us by your might. Hear my prayer, divine protector. Listen to the words of my mouth. How can we pay, repay the Holy One for the gifts that have been given to us. We will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the God of our ancestors. We will fill our vows to our creator in the presence of all our people. Gladly we bring our sacrifices to you. We praise your name, O Amin Ra, for it is good. Amoja, unity. We should strive to maintain unity and family in the family, community, nation, and race. Kuji Chagalia, self-determination. 
we shall define, name, create, and speak for ourselves. Ujima, collective work and responsibility. We should build and maintain our communities together. Our brothers and sisters' problems shall be ours to solve together. Ujama'a, cooperative economics. Together we shall build and maintain our own businesses and together profit from them. Mia, purpose. We shall make our collective vocation the building and developing of our community and the restoration of our people to our traditional greatness. Kulumba, creativity. We shall do as much as we can in any way we can to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than when we inherited it. Imani, faith. We will believe with all our hearts in our God, our people. And in the righteousness and victory of our struggle. Ashe. Ashe. May we please bow our heads in prayer. O oh, Mother, Father, God, she who is of the most high, the maker of all that is and shall be, the giver of all our needs, the knower of what is beyond truth. Hear our prayers, O oh Lord, for we have pledged to give, to give our resources, the sharing of our positive thought, friendship, possessions, earnings from our hard fraught labor, we sacrifice to you. But this light, our prayer light now is bright, for those who give monetarily. This giving helps the Zoom cameras stay on, allows us back into places where we can gather and congregate, gives our ministers the tools and access to the teachings necessary to bring to our people. Please keep blessing us, Amin Ra. Please give us the ability to sacrifice. We understand that sacrifice and giving are bound like the sides of a coin and necessary for our well-being. For how can our church, our community, be strong without giving to that same church, to that same power of Amun-Ra? Our church is our umbrella from Isfet. Our church holds the scholars whose feet we sit at. Our church, our church is the place to give because it gives so much to us. Keep us strong, O Lord. Let our actions show the truth of our words. Allow us to plan the ways to give and understand sacrifice must come so that we, we can move forward, forward for truth, justice, forward for harmony, right order, balance, pride, propriety. Forward for our way of life, Wose's way of life, God's way of life, the way of Ma'at. Bless you all for the coin that you have given. Amen. Ashe. Amen Ra. And on the screen is the uh, ways you can donate uh, uh, mailing addresses and the uh, web addresses. Uh. Anyway, thank you. <clears throat> Ashe, thank you, um, Mama Michelle and Baba Damani. So next, Minister Emotep, to introduce our um, speaker today. I, uh, I'm very happy to uh, have my, um, he's my Seba. And uh, Dr. Asa Hilliard told us a long time ago that a Seba is a star and uh, a Seba is a doorway and a Seba is a teacher and a teacher is a doorway. He has provided a doorway for so many of us in the African community. He is a, a warrior scholar. He's a renowned public speaker. He's a professor workshop leader, author, leader, organizer, visionary of exceptional influence who addresses audiences in the United States, Britain, France, Rotterdam, and Africa. Was, for 38 years, Dr. Oba Tashaka was a professor at San Francisco State University, where he is now Professor Emeritus. He has uh, published uh, newspapers. He has led uh, organizations 
He's been an activist, uh, a courageous activist. Uh, he's an organic scholar. Uh, he's done so ma many uh, things. And uh, as I'm reading his bio, my notes are stuck. Uh, the, the, the thing won't move anymore. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I had so much to say about him. I just want to say that Dr. Obatashak, oh, here it is. It's moving now. All right. So look at this. He's marched with Dr. King in Selma in 1965. Uh, he's addressed uh, uh, people at the Million Man March in 1995. Uh, he uh, has written. Uh, Five books, The Integration Trap, The Generation Gap, The Art of Leadership, Volume One, Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality, Political Legacy of Malcolm X and the Art of Leadership. Dr. Obatashaka is a rare blend of master scholar, master warrior, and charismatic speaker who has, who many, whose many years of organization and scholarship has provided a rich body of experience for writing and teaching and public speaking and master organizer. Sisters and brothers, I want to introduce a friend, a teacher to the African community uh, in the diaspora, Dr. Oba Tshaka. Otep, Jose members, how y'all doing? You see next to me the prize and joy of my life, Pamela oh. Shirley Tashaka, who was uh, associated with Bose, and yesterday was out working uh, for the election of Greg Hodge as mayor of Oakland. So I want to just say, Pam, <laughs> my love. <laughs> and by the way, uh, part of my organizing work um, involved going to the United Kingdom in 2005 to address the uh, anniversary of the Fifth Pan-African Congress. And um, I chaired the political committee to the uh, Sixth Pan-African Congress in Tanzania in 1974. And so I would stay in the homes of different people throughout the United Kingdom. And the last home I stayed in was a lady sitting next to me. So that's also a sign that there's rewards in life when you do work for our people. So um, this morning, first of all, I want to uh, say to uh, Minister Imhotep, I'm really proud of you. He's one of my students in the 70s. And uh, he's, he's gone on to be consistent in practicing ma'at and uh, having a lovely wife and raising a family. And I'm really proud of you, as well as the work of Woze. Um, many times, um, as I chaired Black Studies at San Francisco State, when we brought in speakers uh, such as uh, Ivan Van Sertima, um, who wrote the classic work, They Came Before Columbus, John Henry Clark, who I apprenticed under, and Asa Hilliard, who was my buddy. Um, they had a condition. When they spoke at state, they had to speak in the community. And uh, generally the place that I bring them was Wose Community Church. And um, I remember on one occasion uh, when we had Ivan Van Sertima out, we were driving to Wose and um, I asked him, what was the secret to the beauty of his work? They came before Columbus because it reads like a novel. And he said, I wrote, history like a novel. And so I say that that to say that the work I'm finishing now, my sixth and seventh books on SEVA, which is a replacement system for teaching, um, the method I'm using is Ivan Van Service, I'm telling a story. So I got that in part by taking him to Woze, the way. So um, my presentation, this morning um, is entitled Piping Into God's Mind. This is not going to be your normal intellectual discussion where I'm going to be quoting from a lot of books because 
the book I'm going to be drawing from is a mind of God, who the Dogons call Amma, and who the Kemites call Amun, who the Yorubas call Oludumari, who goes by many names, but all the same. So this is going to be a discussion of the process for thinking God's thoughts or piping into God's mind. And by that, I mean, we all are of God. So God is a part of all of us. God is a light within all of us, which on one level is the soul. On another level is the ka, which is your destiny, uh, your life path. The ba, which is the, the bird with wings with the head of a human being, which is the capacity of the human being to go to the future or the past. And that's the most part of the powers of God that lie within each of us. And so in speaking to piping into God's mind, I want to speak uh, from the standpoint of a life experience and the life experience of other African people who in the process of this were able to do what we all do, or many of us, especially Africans, but most human beings, having access to the creator through our dreams, through our intuition, uh, through our experience of the higher mind that resides within each of us. We know that we are best when we listen to the voice within. And if the voice within tells us not to do something and we do it, we always regret it. And then we say, I wish I hadn't done that. Isn't that true? I know that when the FBI had denied me a job uh, in Marin County, um, I had just led the San Francisco Freedom Movement for five years and uh, my community felt that I needed a job. I had just got married. 1969. And so Ray Richardson saw that I got a job. And then when it came for the superintendent to uh, um, see that that continued, I didn't have a teaching credential. So they're going to give me a provisional teaching credential. The FBI filed a 17 page report. That's called COINTELPRO, counterintelligence program. One of the aims of that was to prevent radicals or militants from getting jobs. The other one was from breathing. And three times they tried to take my life. Uh, so I'm driving to Sacramento because I fight and usually win. And I could win this one because the FBI was saying that they're going to uh, deny me this work because I had been arrested 18 times, two times in the South, the rest in the San Francisco Freedom Movement. So I'm going to hire an attorney, an NAACP attorney. And I knew I'd win this case because these were all misdemeanors. But my spirit said, don't. I'm halfway to Sacramento. So I turn around and come back. Three years later, the same mother in the Black community, Ray Richardson, and another sister named Nancisi Caillou were running Black studies indirectly at San Francisco State. And they got me a job at San Francisco State. So I didn't know why the spirit was telling me not to fight, because I could have won. But the spirit knew more than I knew. They knew that I could teach at the elementary, junior high, high school level, but that wasn't really the place for me. My message was different. And they knew there was something else for me. I didn't know that. And then when I get at San Francisco State, the FBI is again trying to deny me tenure. And Dr. Asa Hilliard was head of my committee and helped me get tenure. So what I'm saying is, in speaking to piping into God's mind, we all have the mind of God, which is part of the essence of God within us. But when I speak of spi uh, piping into God's mind, I'm not just speaking of the normal intuitive experience we have, which is extremely important. And if we disconnect from that, then we're going to disconnect from the wisdom that guides us, particularly in times of crisis or in times in which we're uncertain and we need direction. But I'm talking about, in piping into God's mind, I'm particularly gonna speak about piping into the higher mind, 
In comedic knowledge, they have three concepts. Sia, exceptional intellectual clarity. Who, authoritative um, utterance. And Heka, which is the power of action, which literally means magic. But most of our scholars who don't want to deal with the spirit will usually leave that part out, but that's generally what it means. Exceptional intellectual clarity, many have interpreted to me uh, clear thinking. No, exceptional intellectual clarity is when you pipe into God's mind because what you're able to see and think then is free of error. And generally that's a level that it takes years to reach, reach. So when I speak about piping into God's mind, I'm speaking about communing with God's mind and particularly on higher levels, which is in the realm of what the Dogon calls Sodaya, clear word, or what in our culture we call innovation, which is that realm in which when we pipe into God's mind, we are able to discover new truths. These are truths already there, but not seen before. And this is a universal experience for those at this level, the level of what in this culture is called innovation, which only 2% of any people in any realm reach, 2%. So when Einstein has a dream and Einstein is on a sled going at the speed of light, that dream along with intuition gave him the theory of relativity. If we look at George Washington Carver, George Washington Carver was able to pipe into God's mind through communing with plants because everything God creates has intelligence. And as a result, was able to come up with more breakthroughs in science than any of the other scientists uh, in the 20th century, making him the greatest scientist of the 20th century, perhaps the 21st as well because he combined technical knowledge, which every scientist in every field would have, his in botany and many other fields, Einstein's in quantum physics. Uh, but what he was able to do was come up with breakthroughs in so many different areas that helped to um, advance life and improve life on this earth. So uh, Einstein, and when we look at John Coltrane, who was referred to as one of the influences on Pharaoh Sanders. Uh, John Coltrane, um, after undergoing uh, an experience of alcoholism and drug addiction, when he comes off of it, what he's able to do is then uh, pipe into God's mind. In this case, through a dream. And he heard a sound. And that sound was a music that he said sounded like heaven. And that heavenly sound was a basis for a love supreme. John Coltrane, an ordinary musician for most of his life, but who put in 14 hours of work on his music uh, for years, went from ordinary to extraordinary. And so piping into God's mind is the realm of creativity. That realm of creativity is generally blocked through Western education. And so we have a crisis today, and this is the crisis we have to deal with now. Chancellor Williams correctly dealt with the issue of miseducation of the Negro. He said, four taught the same philosophy, history, psychology of the European. Our mind has been put on control. And so then during the era of uh, segregation, if you're under the control of your oppressor, you don't have to be told to go to the back seat. You will go without being told. So that is the issue we have been dealing with up to now, which is an important issue and uh, one that we need to continue because many of our people are still what I call on remote control. Automatic pilot, double O soul, remote control Negroes. Too many of us are still thinking someone else's thoughts and are being programmed to operate without uh, being told to do so. The extreme examples are clear, a Clarence Thomas. 
but there are others in which we do it unconsciously. But many of us have also freed our minds. And so we have undergone a transformation of consciousness, but we are still caught in the trap of um, their method. Dr. Thea Fellow Bingo makes this observation. He and I talk quite regularly. In fact, if you check out my show, the Dr. Over Tashaka show, last year we had a conversation that was an extensive conversation and very beautiful on African philosophy, history, and culture. And Dr. Obinga makes this observation. We have a contradiction. We have African-centered thought and a European method for teaching. And we're in trouble because if you're using their method, and even though you think you have the correct information, if you use their method, you end up in the same place. You'll find yourself ending up in the same place. How? If you look at how this project began, it began with Plato and what he had, which he called the form. And the form was taught to him by his teacher, Socrates. Socrates learned this from the Chemites, but Plato distorted it. Socrates said, in the pre-existing state, the soul, was able to see the forms. And these were the forms of truth, of justice, of whatever. And these forms were the absolute truths. Now, this was coming from African thought. When Plato got it, he Arianized it. Arian is the correct term for the European, meaning Lord and master. And in this particular case, he despiritualized it. And this is the problem with Aryan or Western education. It is separated spirit from reason. And so how did he do it? He said that the highest level of uh, knowledge comes through the form. And that is what he got from Socrates. And then he does his trick. He separates the forms, each from the other. So truth or justice, or male, or female. And he leaves out spirit. And he places the form above God. So this is taking God out of the picture, okay? It's a clever despiritualization. And then he said, the form can only be known through reason. And this is what you get in Western education you get reason minus intuition, reason minus spirit, and reason minus being. Get this one. Because basically when you're caught into the European or Aryan intellectual trap, knowing is separate from being. So an African-centered thought, if we're gonna reconcile this and bring the teachings of Ma'at, for example, in line uh, with uh, how it should actually operate, then it is not simply teaching that it is harmony, truth, justice, right order, which it is. That's important to teach. But how do you teach it? You teach it by teaching that to know the truth, you must be the truth. Being is knowledge. And being the truth requ requires a transformation of mind, body, and spirit. It requires a sculpting of the person so that they are in line with their soul. So the Aryan approach would be, when they talked about philosophy, their philosophers would say, and Socrates would say this, a philosopher is one who loves the truth. Now, that's true up to a point. Yes, definitely. That's true. And, and if you really know the ultimate truth, that's God. But the African would say, the Akan would say in particular, the philosopher is one who is wise. Huh? See, <laughs> so it's one thing to know a truth, it's another thing to be a truth, 
And it's another thing to be wise. That's a process. And that comes through you drawing from the light that is within you and trying your best to uh, align yourself with your inner truths, the outer truths of harmony, truth, justice, right order, but your inner truths, what are those? Your, your gifts, your desires, what you want to do in life. That's your ka, that's your destiny. And so in applying this to myself, um, Imhotep met me uh, at San Francisco State in the 70s, and I taught a number of classes, the most important of which was African philosophy. And for maybe 20 years, it was the philosophy of the Dogon. And it was taught through this book, Conversations with Ogotemeli. This is a little book, it's a couple of hundred pages long. This man here is a master of three degrees of knowledge, Ogotemeli, who had become blind and who became a master teacher who uh, the Dogon from different parts of Mali would come to converse with and learn from. And this book, Conversations with Ogo Tameli, was a conversation of 30 days on the Jiriso, Beniso, Boloso, the three degrees, Jiriso, forward knowledge, uh, Beniso, sideward knowledge, and Boloso, knowledge from behind, or the back word, W-O-R-D. And so um, for a good 20 years, when I taught African philosophy, I taught it through Ogo Tumeli. And this is a, a method that's used in Africa by not teaching it. Because you see in African teaching methods, it's the same that a John Coltrane learned to master music. They learned it under masters and it was through a discovery process. And so as the master imparts through example and through teaching, but largely through example, this was John Henry Clark's experience with Arthur Schoenberg, who was his first master. I interviewed John the last eight months of his life. He's one of the six masters that I have in the book on Seva. It's a replacement system for this system that's got us in trouble. Because what it does is by taking us out of God's mind and thinking God's thoughts, it imprisons us in a method that is despiritualized. And it is a method that is mechanical. And there's nothing wrong with reason. You need reason, you need common sense. You shouldn't do anything that doesn't make sense. But to restrict the mind solely to reason is to deprive it of its most beautiful experience, which is the experience of drawing on the totality of knowledge, a part, a part of which we can draw from if we're fortunate enough, if God allows us to have a experience where we can think God's thoughts to the point that we can do breakthrough thinking, where we can come up with new innovations to improve the planet. So in teaching conversations with Ogo Tameli, uh, this was part of my transformative process, being involved in the Black Liberation Movement, leading the only successful Black freedom, Black power movement, the San Francisco Freedom Movement in 1960 through 1965, I underwent an awakening. And I realized in the course of that awakening, I didn't know myself and I didn't know my people. I didn't know my enemy. And so it required me to undergo a transformation of identity. And that's led me along with Bulan Leila Wabogo to the discovery of the past of transformation or awakening called the Sixfold Stages to Mental Freedom which on my show, the Dr. Obu Tshaka show, we will be having a webinar for a year, twice a month, a couple hours each time. Sister Fanya, who was a member of Woze, will be one of those taking people through this because she went through this and has gone through it over a period of 40 years and said it was one of the most rewarding experiences that she got out of being a part of the Pan-African People's Organization. Uh, so the transformation of consciousness led me to realize that this Western system of education wasn't just a miseducation system because it was misinformation. 
it was a methodology that imprisoned you. And so over a course of time of apprenticing under masters, uh, but particularly drawing from the uh, thought of uh, Ogo Chimeli, which is the thought of the Dogon. And I started my uh, excursion into African thought through the Dogon deliberately because it was one of the few African systems, ancient African systems still alive at that time. And then later Yoruba, Kemetic and others. And so in the course of this, the Dogon teaching uh, come through a system called Adunaso, A-D-U-N-O, S-O, A-D-U-N-O-S-O. Aduno means universe. So means word or knowledge. Together, knowledge of the universe. So their teachings come through signs or tables of signs that are called the Dunoso because they don't write, it's drawn in the sand. But it is the words of God. And you should note that all of these African systems have this great power. Dr. Wade Nobles and myself, uh, we're into Ifa, uh, the Yoruba system. And one of the great things about Ifa is its divination system that it's able to see into the future and into the past. We both have the same Babalao, or father of mysteries, which is the same term used for priest in ancient Kemet. And he's a great diviner. And so uh, he is, through his system, is drawing from piping into God's mind to see into the future, in this case, your future. And he's given me so many accurate readings that it's funny, you know? And I know that Dr. Nobles has had the same experience. In fact, I can say I'm alive because of his readings, because he saw some things coming to me that if I didn't correct it, I wouldn't be here. So um, Adunoso are signs that Europeans like to call symbols, but they're really more profound than that. It's the thought of Amma or the thought of God. So piping into God's mind in the African system is through a system in this particular case of symbols. And so Imhotep, when he took my class on African philosophy, we uh, taught by not teaching because you had to interpret those symbols yourself, the Adunoso. And you had to uh, see what it meant to you, to apply it to you. And so for me, that was an over 30 year process of realigning myself with the cosmos because that's basically when you pipe into God's mind, God's mind is a totality, a totality of everything. And we'll never get even a small part of that. Einstein thought he was gonna get it. No human's gonna get it. But within a duno so, the signs are a miniature of the universe, something that the forms of Plato broke with. And so every sign, is like we are. We're a miniature universe in the larger universe. If you want to understand God, just look at how God works within you. And astrology is the best system for that. And we've been spookified by that. We've been told that uh, this is devil's work, that this is superstition. And so uh, astronomy is okay. But how do you apply it to yourself? Astrology is based on astronomy. And astrology was discovered by the Chemites, you know? Um, and the Chemites said, for based on a person's time, date, and year of birth, they could tell the course of a person's life and they could even predict their death. Now, no one in the West knows how to do that. And if I did, I, I wouldn't want to know. You know, I don't want to know how that's going to happen. But uh, the uh, Chemites were the authority for that. And uh, where does that come from? Herodotus. We quote Herodotus on uh, the Chemites being Black, but we leave that part out. Why do we do that? Again, despiritualization. What good is astronomy if you don't have an application to the human being? You need both. And, and they've done that in every area. Physics. You need metaphysics, you know? so that you understand how the forces that are in nature are in you. 
and how it works. And when you understand that, you understand there's no separation between you and nature, you and the cosmos. We are one. But in the form, what Plato does is separate man from woman and puts man over woman and then separates man and woman from nature and puts man over nature. And the Bible does the same thing says man was given lordship over woman. God didn't say that. Man is given lordship over the planet. God didn't say that. The planet, uh, nature, is, a, is an extension of God. And if you try and exercise lordship over nature, it's like trying to exercise lordship over your mother, except it's big mama. You hear me? And so you're seeing the storms, the hurricanes, the earthquakes, all this is happening now. Jacob Carruthers, one of my master teachers, a brother that I love deeply, one of the two best people on ancient Kemet in the world, him and Dr. Theophilo Binga, Dr. Theophilo Binga holds that title now on his own. He described Western science as a mad science, not because science is bad, but the philosophy of science that is about control. Francis Bacon, who's the author of empirical science, Nothing wrong with a part of his approach, which is to observe nature. But for what purpose? To control nature. And then he said, to create a new nature. And that's what you're seeing now with, uh, you know, these uh, seeds that aren't really seeds, you know, um, modified. So that once you put them in the ground, you can no longer plant a normal seed. That's a new nature. Who in the heck would want to do that except someone that's going against nature? So if we're going to free our minds, what we have to do is um, work on the internal cultivation of ourselves to clear our mirrors, to polish our mirrors, to try and uh, purify them as much as possible so that we can be open to God's light. But it's only those that aspire to it, because it's only those that want to be the best in whatever they do. I've talked to musicians who have told me, and they're great musicians, they've told me, I did, I've never aspired to be the greatest, because if you get up there, then uh, there are going to be other people who are going to be on your case. You know what I mean? And, and I don't knock that, so that's your choice. And, but they were masters. They were imp, 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 improvisers, you know? They have a new sound within an existing school. But if you aspire to be the very best, then, and you've got questions to advance humanity, then that's when piping into God's mind can happen, if you've done the hard work. Some of us do less hard work than others because God gives some of us more gifts. In the case of music, Charlie Parker, as uh, Dizzy Gillespie said, was given gifts, he didn't have to do a lot of work. Didn't take him long, and he was blowing every other saxophone player away. In fact, after they threw a cymbal at him when he was playing in Kansas City, a cymbal indicating that his music was sounding bad, he went into the Ozarks and brought uh, Prez, one of the great Lester Young, one of the great saxophone players music and slowed it down so he could hear exactly how he played. And when he came back with that alto saxophone, he blew all the saxophone players away. So you had musicians throwing their saxophones in the river. You hear me? So he had a gift and didn't have to work hard. But Coltrane had to work hard. I've had to work hard. Anyone that's normally gifted, you got to put out the work. So I want to speak in conclusion on this and piping into God's mind the greatest experience of my life that came through the trials of weaknesses. Because I think part of, in the case of Coltrane, he was able to get to the point of innovation in music because he was over, he was able to overcome the weakness of self-doubt. And uh, the weaknesses that then led him to alcoholism and drug addiction. And after two weeks of cold turkeying, he sits up in his bed one morning and his first wife, Naima, she said, John, what's happened? He said, I've heard a music from heaven. And that was a result of him overcoming some weaknesses of self-confidence and um, overcoming 
depending on external sources, because a lot of our people have had that. And in my case, mine came from uh, realizing at a certain point that I was strong on the masculine and weak on the feminine. I could see in a battle how to take an opponent out. I've never lost a battle. But when it came to seeing things right in front of me that I should have been able to see, I couldn't see it. And I understood that was because I was weak on the feminine side. And being an astrologer, I, I understood that in advance. So I went on retreats for five years, three months a year for five years, 15 months of looking at myself, camped out in nature and looked at myself, internal self-cultivation, purifying my mirror. And then after 15 months of work, I started working on something I had never planned to write before which is return to the African mother principle of male and female equality. I had never planned to write this before, but it was kind of like a completion of my quest, but it was also bigger because I was raising the question of how to build just societies. And so after going through 15 months of work, I started writing on this book. And in the course of that, I was able to pipe into God's mind. And of all the experiences in my life, I had the most beautiful experience of my life, which was when I asked God, because when I was writing this book, I was heavily drawing on the Dogon system for just societies. So I asked God, what did Africa mean uh, when it had created societies of justice? What was it based on? And I saw this beautiful light. God is a white light. When you say the light within you, that is a small speck that's a soul that's within you. And you know, when we sing the song, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, that's the light within you. And if we're gonna understand our ancestors that withstood enslavement, part of the reason is they lived outside of time because they had this sense of the light that was within them. And their greatest wish was that they be able to be free of the manacles of slavery so that they could express their gifts and make a contribution to humanity, which they were making under enslavement because they created a new African culture and an art form, both of which are the popular cultures and art forms of the world. What people do that in enslavement of people who are not spiritually enslaved because they had God within them and knew it. And so when I saw this beautiful light, and I've had this experience two times, this light communicated without speaking, telepathically. When I talked to my Baba Lao, he said, that's the way the old spirits used to communicate with us. And that's a direct communication because God's a light. When I say God's a light, in my show, the Dr. Albert Tshaka show, I refer to a great Lakota holy man. His name is Fool's Crow. Fool's Crow is a great healer. And um, at times when he needed help, he would be in the um, place where the Native Americans go, the sweat lodge, and uh, God would call on him. And his spirit would leave his body. That's called astral projection, where your spirit flies to another place. And he would, his would leave for two or three days. Most people have this experience called astral projection. I know some of you that are listening to this do. And that's usually in sleep. And it's usually for a few seconds because heaven's outside of space and time. You can learn a lot in milliseconds in heaven that would take you years to learn on earth. But he would commune with God for days and other spirits, and he would go to the highest heaven. There are many heavens. The highest heaven is the heaven of the light. And what did he see? He was asked, what did God look like? He said, God's a great white light. And then he said, Mother Earth is a great green light. He said, the heavens, that is, you know, the sky, is a great blue light. And he communed with them, but especially with God. 
And so this light that I experience, which all of you have within you, is this light of God. And so in the question of what was the basis of just societies of Africa, and this is what a lot of people don't get when they read the mother principle, over and over again, they'll see the same thing repeated. And they'll say, oh, this is a thesis. That would be a Western idea. That would be a logical point that someone is making that may or may not be true, a hypothesis, a guess, no, uh -uh. this is a vision. And so the light without speaking said, the just societies of Africa were those where all the males and females were equally empowered to govern every phase of society. That is a reflection of God's mind, which is a totality of knowledge. And in this particular case, a totality of truth within a particular realm. So in a duno so, knowledge of the world or of the universe, each part is a whole. And so within each part of the aduno so, so-called symbol is within anything is everything. So within you is a whole stellar system. You're a miniature star. And in fact, Seba means bringing the light that is within out. One of the ways you change the system of teaching from the Western system to your own that frees you is instead of basing education on just depositing stuff in people, you bring out what is within. You hear what I'm saying? You open the door of the person's light. That's what the book on several, one of the things that it's dealing with. So I'm concluding by saying that um, piping into God's mind is the highest level of education, the highest level of knowledge. We only get a part of it. And it's dependent upon what your path in life is because each of us are here for different purposes. But those that aspire to that, that's what it's based on. And why does God open God's mind up to us only when we're doing good? only when we want to share for the advancement of humanity. That's why George Washington Carver was the greatest scientist. He didn't care about material things. He just cared about people, his own people first, and then humanity after that, you understand? And he didn't do anything to produce harm for humanity. So piping into God's mind is your best educational experience. That university is inside of you. <laughs> You hear me? That universe, university, universe, understand? It's inside of you. It comes through your mother and father who you picked in heaven. You're on a divine course that you chose. It's a question of what you do with it. Hotel. Oh, I say, I say. I say. I say. Woo. I say. All right. I say. All right. All right. I want to. I want to uh, thank Dr. Tashaka. I mean, what can we say? That was the, the uh, I'm taking down a thousand notes and trying to listen and write at the same time, but the Adula soul, the, the, the jury soul, the Benny soul, the Bella soul, I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to get all of it because he's able to articulate the things that we're thinking about, the things that we're studying. And if you are, are like myself, this is a master teacher. I say, and I say, oh. this is what you can find at Wolf Say. Yes, yes. And so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about this, but right now it's time to open up the doors, uh, open up the minds, open up the hearts. And if you find any, if anyone out there is not a member of Wolf Say, if you want to join, I open you up to join right now. I'm, I'm, I'm still just processing this information. I just want to thank you, uh, Dr. Tashaka. Uh, the doors of the church are open. I say. I say. I say. Yes. And let me also say, I enjoyed uh, Dr. Tushaka spending having lunch with your lovely wife yesterday. She told you we had a treat of a time after going out to do some door knocking for uh, 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 Baba Greg. Baba Greg. I say. Uh, I say. <laughs> Thank you. Right on. And you know, we love both of you. 
And brother, you're lucky to have a lady like this. Yes, sir. No doubt. Hey, you do know that, don't you? Huh? <laughs> uh, and by the way, I just want to say, Connie uh, did magnificent work in seeing that you know her brother uh, was able to walk freely on this earth. That was magnificent work that you did. You knew who to pick. You knew how to put it together. Not too many brothers have a sister like that, and too, not too many sisters have a brother like that. And they should appreciate you. you no, I, you know, I have good friends that made me look real good. <laughs> I, I, they, they, they did a lot. And, and community, uh, we'll say community came out to support. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, I, I am, a, you know, as I was saying yesterday to the people we met and didn't say yesterday about Baba Greg, he's a communitarian. I'm a communitarian. <laughs> Sydney is a communitarian. Mm -hmm. We're here in the community doing the work that needs to be done and thankful to do it. Uh, so I, I, yeah, my, yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Ashe, amen. Ashe, Ashe. Ashe. So I, I still have my book that I bought in, uh, like, I guess, 1990 with your assignment, but, but from your assignment. Inside is the note of the final that you gave on 10, at 1045 to 120. And okay. I think I got an A in your class. <laughs> <laughs> I say, I say, I say, I say, I say. I say. Um, yes, I, I'm gonna follow that. I got an A in your class too, Baba Tashaka. Over to Shaka, my mentor, my teacher. This brother got me into help get me into medical school. Uh, he was always so phenomenal, such an out inspiring leader. He yes. taught me so much. I love him dearly. I was getting A's in your class as a student in Black Studies at San Francisco State and worked with Pan-African People's Organization. Just such an uplifting scholar. I appreciated this session today. It was so powerful and so spiritual. And I just feel blessed to know that I'm one of your students and one of your sisters and one of your comrades. And I give thanks. Baba Ustadi sent me the information. I didn't know that you was going to be speaking today. I listened to your show yesterday. But I would, you know, I'm just saying I've gone to Wose before. This is Sister Haiba. I've gone to Wose before. And I'm just feeling after I'm just feeling so uplifted and spiritual that I want to join again. I'm in Atlanta. Is it okay if I'm in Atlanta and I join? <laughs> you can join. <laughs> I say, I say, I say, I say, yes. I say, I say, I say, oh. I say. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I say. Well, that is phenomenal. I remember how phenomenal. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And it still is. Mo. I, I, I saw you there. I said, hi, Eva. Right here, this is one bad <laughs> sister, you know. Oh, Once she moved from the Bay Area and she moved to Atlanta and you know became a doctor, she's a OBYGN. She gave birth to a son who's a surgeon who was <laughs> wild as I don't know what when he was a child. But that was one of those brains going all over the place. You know what I mean? And she brought me down to uh, speak uh, at in February the 22nd, 2003, at your okay. Malcolm X Grassroots yes. Center. And I was had the honor to stay in your place. But it was an honor this is a lady that I'm really proud of. You know, you have this opportunity because in teaching, um, it's a two-way process. And I learned from my students. And mm -hmm. to see lights like this brighten makes you proud. Mm -hmm. This is a sister that set up her own practice. She's been active in uh, Malcolm X grassroots organization. She's seen that her children were all active in the Black Freedom Movement. She is one solid, Black-minded, African-minded sister. And brilliant. I'm proud I of say, you. Really my proud teacher, of you. give me so much love and praise. I, I say. see, I see. Say, I, 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 like I, say ask, I like to ask, uh, sister. You taught us. So I like much. to ask. I like to ask, sister. Do you know the uh, the, the Holmes family, sister Halima? 
uh, who's, who's a, a doctor. I think she's an OBGYN physician also. Is she in she's Atlanta? Lives in the Atlanta area. I'm not sure exactly where, where, but somewhere in the Atlanta area. I'm not sure what hospital she's associated with, but um, and, and what her married name is. But she was Halima Holmes before she married. And uh, um, she's in the, in the Atlanta area. And she's a physician, and as I'm understanding, uh, OBGYN. Oh, well, we yeah, have they live in Decatur, Baba. They live in Decatur. Decatur. They're in Decatur. Oh, yeah. and the hurricane says she's at Kaiser. But they live in Decatur. Oh. Yeah, I have a uh, brother, um, uh, McGee, <clears throat> and they just never did. All right. S Sister Habiba, uh, uh, I would like for you to. Um, uh, get in touch with uh, Baba Tai uh, to get your information. Yeah, can I, I can I jump in, Brother Minister, Sister Habiba? This is Baba Tai. I just sent you a a private chat and asking for Thank your you. email address. Just send me your email address, and I'll add you to the Wose mailing list, and we'll uh, continue the process. Asante, Asante yes. Sana. Thank you. You're welcome. Shay. Uh, hi, Eva. Tell Akinyeli okay. Moja to give me a call. I will. He yes. just reveres you, Baba. He reveres you. Yes. Tell him to give me a call. I would tell him to call you, yes. Uh, and we uh, tell the people about your fabulous show. I got to tune in yesterday yet for the first time. It's just phenomenal. I'm going to join that, too. Thank you. Well, I'm enjoying you. you keep up the good work, lady. You know? uh, Shay, I say, well, you you were my teacher. What, what else can I do? <laughs> I mean, well, you, you I, learned, my I learned I from you. I learned from you, lady. You hear me? <laughs> yes, indeed. Mm. Wow. Wow. So nice. so nice. Wow. I just, I just would like to add that I'm another one of um, Dr. Obatushaka's students. Um, two thousand, the early two thousands. I um, got a math well, a, a bachelor's in Africana studies. And I, I saw you every day, all day, doctor. And I'm telling you, you brought a transformative spirit out of me that I would, yes. have, never, I would have never known had I not experienced your instruction and your mastery because it was phenomenal. And every chance I get, I, I know um, M, M. Hotep, I'm a, I am acquainted with Baba Makalisi, and I just want to say that I'm, I'm, I would like to speak to someone about joining um, either the Oakland um, Sister Darnisha, you know, me, our cool, you know, I'm TCXPI, the Chingwe X Project. So I'm, I'm trying to do things here in Oakland now, and doctor, you are a big part of my inspiration. So I give thanks. Thank you. Uh, you Did know, that. let me say something. You know, let me say something here. Um, every teacher is a student. Every student is a teacher. And um, one of the books that um, M Brother Emotep referred to, Integration Trap, Generation Gap Caused by a Choice Between Two Cultures. This book, this book also involves piping into God's mind. By the way, you can get this through Gumroad, go to Dr. Obertashaka's show, buy it through Gumroad. But that ain't why I'm saying this. Um, this comes again through the teacher learning from the student. And this is a part, and this is one of the two writings that I've done that have piped into God's mind. Brother Ustadi will tell you that uh, the major conclusion of the integration trap generation gap caused by a choice between two cultures is that what's hit black community since 1968, various forces that have um, disorganized black communities, weakened black families, created the prison industrial complex, killed off a whole lot of black leadership, a whole bunch of stuff. This comes from God. These words are piping into God's mind. When I'm asking, so I, I had a class at state in the eighties and a young student, probably no more than 18, Ask me, if our culture is so strong, why does it have so many holes in it now? And I gave her an answer, and then I came home and realized I didn't have the answer. 
And I went back and apologized for giving the wrong answer. I didn't feel bad about that. I made a mistake. What I felt bad about was not knowing the answer. You know what I mean? And so I'm sitting in my study one night, actually first, uh, you know, before TV, it was in Richmond, California, and James Baldwin came on and Baldwin, um, absolutely brilliant. This was a, a statement he made that was recorded and he was dead by the time I heard it. He said, since the late sixties, powerful hostile forces have hit the black community that we were not prepared for. That clicked. That gave me half the answer, okay? Because I didn't have the answer because I was coming out of these movements and I'm still organizing in Poplo, different things, Pan-African People's Organization, but I'm able to see um, the trees, but I'm not able to get the forest in perspective, you know? So I'm sitting in my study one night feeling humble. And it was the same thing with the light that came that led me to this vision of the just society. And uh, again, I see this light. This time it's a smaller light because the question I'm asking about just society is a big question. And by the way, that formula I gave you, that's the key to you transforming your families, your communities, this nation and the world, that formula for just societies. Because humanity lived under that formula for nearly 200,000 years. See, that isn't just some abstract formula. All the males and females being equally empowered to govern every phase of society, that's the Twa. And the Twa existed in that state for at least 120 to 130,000 years. You hear me? We don't study the Twa. By the way, one of my innovations in history is I brought the Twa in as the foundation. Go look at my shows and look at the series I've done on the Twa and look at the Anu. I study pre-dynastic Kemet. I know the dynastic stuff, but why is it we don't study pre-dynastic? That's where all the creativity occurred. All the philosophy, the language, the spiritual system, all of it was constructed in pre-dynastic Kemet, but we don't study it. And guess who founded that? The Anu, Twa, agrarian Twa, Asar, who was he? Anu. This period, this picture right here, that's an Anu person. This is the oldest proof that the dynastic system, the pharaonic system of Kemet came from Africa. And when Obinga and Sheikh Anna Diop made their argument at UNESCO, that was their strongest argument right there. They didn't care that they were Anu. They just was proving that they were black. That's all they could, cared about. And I had <laughs> Obinga translate this for me because I didn't trust Petrie's translation. He's supposedly an authority on so-called pre-dynastic Kemet and Obinga corrected it and pointed out that this little guy here is a great one. His left foot is forward. That means he's royalty. Uh, he's got the staff of authority. That means elder. That also means Meru Netcher. You know, mm -hmm. the staff of authority is speech. And he's come to worship the Pharaoh on the upper uh, side there, you'll see three vertical registers. That's the name of the founders of Kemet. It means great ones, great ones. And they're called Anu. And where do they get that name from? Ani, Asar. He was the first pharaoh of the great ones. And he's come to worship the god, which you see an animal with two ears. That's not Horus, that's Set. Because in pre-dynastic Kemet, and pre-dynastic is not a correct term because they had dynasties in ancient Kemet. I've retitled this. I'm not going to tell you what I've retitled it. That's a part of the new historiography. But I'm telling you, uh, pre-dynastic might be behind. They founded this thing. And so uh, what this, this thing here is showing you is the foundation for your civilization. But in terms of the point that um, was made, by the great writer on uh, the powerful forces that hit our communities since 68. Um, I'm sitting in my study, so I'm asking, so what happened? And I see this light, and what does the light say? A choice between two cultures. That's the subtitle of this book. It's saying that the forces that hit our community, deindustrialization that took jobs away, that did more to break up black families than anything, because from 
1865 to 1968, 75 percent of our families were two-parent households. Now only 29 percent are. The Black family's taken a greater hit between 68 and now than between 1619 and 1968. You hear what I'm saying? Huh? And so there's some new forces that have hit us. And so what has this done? It's caused the choice between two cultures. For the first time in our people's history, some of our youth are being put in a position of choosing between our culture and theirs and not even knowing it because we haven't spent enough time studying our own culture. We study African culture, we should, but we should spend as much time studying African-American culture. So some of our youth think we don't have a culture. You understand? And when they're slipping off into white culture, they don't even know what they're slipping off into. And the two biggest slippages is in the area of individualism and materialism. You hear me? Those are the biggest breaks that the youth will tell you that a sector of their generation has taken. But that, that generation is also waking up. Black Lives Matter. With some of us conscious people put down, you shouldn't. It put Trump out of the White House. He should be ready for the jailhouse if anyone had courage to stick his fat behind in jail. That's exactly where he needs to go. So there's an awakening among the youth, the 20 years and younger. Their eyes are opening up. That's why I'm doing the show. Our main viewing audience is young people, 20 to 40. The largest group is 20 to 30 all over the world. You hear me? That's why I'm doing it. I, I mean, if I was just talking to my, my folks, I'm talking to the choir. I'm not into that. I'm not a good singer anyway. <laughs> but I'm not going to be playing to the choir. The choir don't need me. You know what I mean? It's these younger people because they're the ones that are going to pick it up. And then the elders who've got the wisdom who come in and bring something into it. So um, I say that to say this. That book is a product of me learning from my students. You hear me? They showed me I didn't have an answer. And then when I went digging for it, I got the, the second biggest answer of my life. The first one is the vision for just societies. The second one is what's the problem, the nature of the problem that affects our community. It's not just here, but it's around the world. And when you pipe into God's mind, God gives you the whole of a particular answer. So in anything is everything. So it gave both the problem and the solution. The problem is, so you've been put in a position of choosing between two cultures. The solution is anything you deal with, whether it's economic empowerment, self-defense, rebuilding families, rebuilding communities, culture better be at the center of it. You hear me? That's where your strength is. So again, teaching is learning. And I've learned a lot from my students. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good to Thank see you, you, Baba, Dr. Baba Bishaka, and Mama Pam. Love you, love you, love you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was a beautiful experience. I, I felt like it was like Thank when you, you watch the movie and then the, the credits roll and so many people leave out. And then there's a there's a whole nother scene that happens that's so exciting. So that was that 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 other teaching that you just gave. That was so exciting. Thank you. So now we're going to have, um, and thank you all for letting me be a host today. Uh, we are going to uh, have Mr. Makalisi come with Lift Every Voice and Sing, and then we're going to close out with Minister Imhotep. If I can just jump in for one minute, sister, uh, Minister Alicia. Uh, just, sure. just time with time, I want to make two quick, uh, to say two quick things. One is Sister Habiba, I didn't get your email address, so would you please send it to me so we can do a follow-up. I sent you a private chat. And the second thing is, we are going to have a meeting immediately after uh, the end of the service tonight. So that we we in Oakland, we in Mose Oakland can nominate can make nominations for our upcoming COE elections. Oh, thank you. Also, did did we did not, not Sister Chinwe and Sister uh, Cornelius say she wanted to join Mose? Um, yes, I, I sent a note to Baba Tai. Yeah, I got I got her I got her email address. Yes. Yes, you did. You did. <laughs> you did, uh, Mama. Okay, thank you. Good thanks.
All right, are we ready for the song here? Yes, we are. Yes. Ashi. Ashi. <laughs> Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the glistening skies. Let it resound loud as the roaring seas. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun, let us march on, march on, till victory. I don't know where I got lost in it. <laughs> Facing the rising sun for a new day. We begun. Let us march on till victory is won. March on with them and rock. March on in the spirit of mud. March on with septipid power every day, every hour. Then let's do all we can for truth and justice throughout this land, the sacred African way, Uncle Johnson Nebashi. March on, march on, with Amin Ra. Ooh, I see, as well as I know this song, how did I get lost in it? Oh my goodness. I, I heard somebody say the other day that the closer you get to the most high, the, the closer the devil tries to get to you. So I guess that was one of those tricks. I Help say, me, Holy One. You were full of so much else. I, I say, but so I didn't have room for some of them words. <laughs> I say, I say. Let us let us conclude, sisters and brothers, and now unto them who is able to lift us up faultlessly before the throne on high. May they empower us to be a people with one aim, one aim, one, aim. one vision, one vision, one, vision. One, vision. One, faith. One, faith. one faith, one destiny, one, one destiny. destiny, one love, one love, one, love. one heart, one heart. One heart. heart. One God. One, one God. God. One God. Let us call upon the name of that one God as our ancestors and elders have done for countless generations, for time and memorial. Let us all say together, Ah. You are the most beautiful people on the face of this earth. earth. I yes, I say.